Okay, welcome back to American Lit 4, week 11. Uh, today we're going to start off by reviewing our two stories by Amy Tan, Fish Cheeks and Two Kinds. Then we're going to uh, introduce a writer uh, called Hunter S. Thompson, talk a little about gonzo journalism, and we're going to talk about a story that he wrote, a novel, uh, based in fact about a gang, a motorcycle gang called Hell's Angels. We're going to talk a little bit about a publication called Rolling Stone Magazine. And then we're going to introduce uh, Esperanza Spalding, who is considered the 21st century jazz genius. We're going to have a uh, short poem by Philip Levine called The Simple Truth. And I'm going to introduce uh, next week's uh, reading, which is actually a video. I'll provide both for you, but I really recommend looking at the video. It follows the story precisely. And that's by a distant, distant cousin, uh, Ambrose Bierce. Uh, we'll introduce the writings of uh, Tashi Mori, and uh, Kasaya Noda, uh, a Japanese uh, immigration to the United States and uh, their stories. So uh, let's start off uh, with a review uh, from Amy Tan's uh, Fish Cheeks and Two Kinds. Okay, welcome back to American Lit 4, week 11. <clears throat> Today we're going to uh, review our two stories that we've read for week 10 by Amy Tan. And these stories uh, connect to what it feels like to assimilate into a new culture. And Amy Tan, in a couple of uh, magazine interviews, states the following about her feelings about assimilating into American culture. So let me read this. Uh, Young Amy Tan was deeply unhappy with her Asian appearance and heritage. She was the only Chinese girl in the class from the third grade until she graduated from high school. She remembers trying to belong and feeling frustrated and isolated. I felt ashamed of being different and ashamed of feeling that way, she remarked in a Los Angeles Times interview. In fact, she was so determined to look like an American girl that she even slept with a clothespin on her nose hoping to slim its Asian appearance. By the time Amy was a teenager, she had rejected everything Chinese. She even felt ashamed of eating horrible five-course Chinese meals and decided that she would grow up to look more American if she ate more American foods. Quote, there is this myth, she said, that America is a melting pot. But what happens in assimilation is that we end up deliberately choosing the American things, hot dogs, apple pie, and ignoring the Chinese offerings. From uh, Newsweek magazine, April 1989. Okay, so Amy Tan absolutely uh, creates autobiographical connections to almost all of her story. Now, 
Some of it's absolutely 100% true. And some of it is a combination of truth, maybe not her story, somebody else's story, a story that she heard, something like that. Okay, so our first story, Fish Cheeks, is uh, set in uh, California. And uh, Amy's parents have invited their minister and his son to a Christmas Eve dinner. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, this tells me that the uh, Amy's family is actually pretty progressive. In generally speaking, uh, in Asia, China, Japan, Korea. Uh, you don't get invited to someone's house. It's a privacy type of issue. Um, even best friends, when they want to meet, usually meet in a restaurant or a coffee shop. So for the family to actually invite uh, someone else to their home tells me that they're, that they're pretty progressive. Okay. So, she starts off the story, she's uh, 14 years old, and she fell in love, uh, what she thinks is love, uh, with the minister's son. And uh, he's not Chinese, and she says he's white as Mary in the manger. So this harkens back to the traditional Christmas cards that we send to one another that shows Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus sitting in the, uh, kneeling in the uh, barn where Jesus is born. And Mary uh, in those uh, pictures looks white. But if we trace things back to Jesus' origin, he's uh, Middle Eastern. He's not white. So why is Mary white? Good question. All right. So she uh, says that she uh, prayed for a uh, slim new American nose. So this goes right back to the clothespin story that we just talked about. And she's really in a twist over her parents not um, creating a traditional American Christmas Eve dinner, which would be either turkey or ham. But uh, the parents, or her mother especially, has uh, created uh, a Chinese uh, menu. And so the first thing that happens is there's a knock on the door and it's the minister and his son, Robert. Now, in a traditional Chinese home, a guest comes to the door, if they had something at their own house, everyone would get up and meet them at the door. There's always an exchange of gifts. Gift giving is huge in Asia. But she doesn't say this, but traditionally in an Asian home, you take off your shoes and put on slippers to enter the house. She doesn't mention this at all. Okay, so she uh, goes into great uh, detail using a lot of uh, simile, uh, describing the meal that her mother has prepared. So um, she talks about something called prawns. And uh, prawns are nothing more than uh, shrimp. Um, she talks about cod, which is a kind of uh, ocean fish. 
And she talks about dried uh, fungus. Okay, so the Chinese call uh, mushroom uh, fungus. And uh, it's dry. You have to soak it for some time, and then it returns to its natural shape, usually black. She talks about uh, tofu uh, looking like rubbery white sponges. And uh, the tofu has become popular now. Uh, you can buy it in almost any American uh, supermarket. And it's made of uh, soybean. And uh, it's a health food. Uh, people consider it very healthy. Uh, she talks about uh, squid, which is another seafood. Looks kind of like an octopus. And she's very descriptive about the way that it's prepared. Some uh, knife cuts on the back uh, that uh, when you roast it or cook it, uh, makes a nice display. And she says it looks something like a bicycle tires. Um, okay, so Robert and Amy have kind of a weird uh, relationship. Um, she likes him. He's not uh, excited about being here tonight. The minister kind of dragged him along. And they meet at the doorway. And um, Robert just uh, grunts, uh, hello. Hello. And Amy pretends that she doesn't hear him. He's not worthy of uh, existence. Okay, so teenage girl stuff. If you really like somebody, you have to ignore them. Okay, so uh, usually in the uh, American and European custom, um, there are uh, platters or bowls of food, and it's passed one to another. Uh, taking out your helper. But in a, a Chinese way, um, this isn't done. Okay. Uh, in a typical Chinese restaurant, you'd have a round table. In the center of the round table would be a, a tray that moves around. And you just kind of slide the tray along and you take out your whatever it is that you, that you decide that you want to eat, uh, using chopsticks, okay. So the minister and son, they're trying their best to uh, get this done with chopsticks, uh, not very well. Uh, so things are not going good for Amy. She wants to die. She wants to just kind of slide down the chair and hide under the table, and pretend she's not there. Now it gets worse when uh, her father, uh, the fish is on the table. Now when the Chinese cook the fish, they cook the whole fish. So the head is there, the tail is there. So Amy's father takes the chopsticks goes right into the fish cheek right here, pulls out a great big chunk of it and passes it to Amy and says, here's your favorite part. Thinking he's doing her a favor and she is mortified. And they kind of eat their dinner, finish it up. The father lets out a big burp. Uh, which is a sign that it was a delicious meal. So I asked my uh, Chinese uh, friends about this. And they said that that's a really old, old uh, custom. You probably wouldn't see it today at all. So she's kind of playing a little time warp with that. Okay, so she, they leave... Um, 
somehow the minister and, the, and his son kind of get through the evening okay. Uh, it's time for Amy's mother to get into the act. She says to Amy, you want to be the same as American girls on the outside. And she gives her a gift, an early uh, Christmas gift. And the gift is a um, beige brown uh, mini skirt, which was all the rave back when this story was written. Typical American teenage girl fashion clothes of the day. Okay, so she says, kind of explaining to Amy that, you know, but inside you must always be Chinese. You must be proud you are different. Your only shame is to have shame, which is the major theme of the story. Now, in most of Amy Tan's stories, uh, she always, at the end, has some sort of reflection back. And she says in the last paragraph, even though I didn't agree with her then, I knew that she understood how much I was suffering during the evening's dinner. It wasn't until many years later, long after I had gotten over my crush on Robert, that I was able to fully appreciate her lesson and the true purpose behind our particular menu. For Christmas Eve that year, she had chosen all my favorite foods. So the mother, even though um, she keeps very traditional Chinese values, understands that her daughter uh, is kind of caught in between two uh, different cultures. And Amy wants to be more American. Mother realizes that and uh, tries actually tries to help her to, to be that. So that's our uh, first uh, story, uh, Fish Cheeks by Amy Tan. Okay, so our second story is called uh, Two Kinds, again by Amy Tan. And this is part of the movie, uh, The Joy of Luck Club, which is 14 stories. It's about four women who left China during very difficult times, had to make uh, very difficult decisions to escape. Uh, China is at war. Uh, they immigrate to the United States, sometimes having to leave friends and family behind to do so. Very tragic and based uh, on uh, true uh, circumstances. So these uh, four women, uh, when they come to California, uh, have a, a little social club where they meet uh, weekly to play a Chinese game called Mahjong. And Mahjong is kind of a chess game. So, um, the central figure in the movie and in the book, uh, it doesn't really say in the story that we read what her name was, but she goes by the name of uh, Jing Mei Wu. Okay, so um, Jing Mei, uh, Jing means uh, gold and Mei means uh, beautiful. So, uh, what uh, happens is the Mahjong Club meets weekly as typical, sorry about the beeping, I don't know what that is, uh, during the Mahjong game, the women uh, always brag 
about their uh, children. Uh, they each have a daughter about the same age. The daughters were born in America, kind of hearkening back to our uh, Fish Cheeks, Amy Tan situation, trying to assimilate into a new culture. Uh, and it traces their lives uh, and compares it to their mother's lives in China. So the girls actually have it on easy street compared to uh, what their mother had, mothers had to go through in China growing up and escaping uh, to the United States. And they all have dreams uh, for their kids. And uh, Jigme Wu's uh, mother uh, wants to find something special that uh, Jing Mei can do. She believes uh, in the American dream that uh, you can, um, if you work really hard, uh, you can have whatever you want. Uh, she tries many different uh, situations to try to bring out the genius in um, Jing Mei. Uh, Jing Mei is not having any part of this whatsoever. She doesn't care. She doesn't think she's a genius. She has no self confidence. So in the backdrop of the story, another one of the women, Auntie Lido, has a daughter named Waverly. And Waverly has become a chess uh, champion. And uh, Auntie Lindo is always bragging about the new trophy that uh, Waverly has just brought home. And so all these women are always trying to outdo each other with what their kids are doing. Kind of a typical mother to mother type of deal, bragging about their kids. So uh, Mrs. Wu uh, tries to find whatever Jing Mei's talents are. She's watching TV. And she talks about a famous American uh, young girl actress called Shirley Temple. And she thinks maybe Jing Mei could be the next Shirley Temple. So she takes her to a um, hair salon. Not a typical hair salon, but a a school hair salon where trainees learn the art of uh, hairdressing. And it's usually uh, very cheap to get your hair cut. So they, Shirley Temple is known for her curly hair and they try it out and it's a total disaster. So they have to cut all the hair that they just curled and now uh, Jing Mei uh, looks like a Peter Pan. Uh, it'll grow back. So that doesn't work out too well. Next, she tries uh, to test uh, Amy's uh, intellectual abilities by um, reading uh, from uh, magazines and books such things like what are the capitals of all the countries in the world. And uh, Jing Mei fails terribly. She's absolutely not interested. Uh, she's described as listening to the foghorn bellow from miles away rather than listening to her mother. Um, she finally 
her mother finally uh, comes up with the idea that she can learn to play the piano. So the mother uh, works out uh, cleaning houses and she offers the older gentleman downstairs, a retired piano teacher, uh, housekeeping uh, in exchange for piano lessons. Now, he is, uh, his name is Mr. Jung, and uh, he uh, is a deaf, which is not really good to, if you're a piano teacher, and he's going blind. But somehow he's able to teach uh, Jing Mei the basics. Um, she uh, is playing games with him while they practice, intentionally hitting wrong notes, uh, doing everything she can to disrupt the lesson. And she does have to uh, practice uh, every day. I think it's around four o'clock, four to six. She's supposed to be practicing her uh, piano lessons. Okay, so um, Mr. Chung uh, comes over weekly, gives his lesson, and he thinks that uh, Jing Mei is uh, doing fine. And they decide to um, enter her into a local talent show uh, to play the piano. And the piece of music that she is going to play at her recital is called A Pleading Child. Um, somehow they get her a, a, a piano to uh, practice on through the mother's uh, housekeeping duties. And the uh, talent show is in a couple of weeks. Amy kind of half-heartedly practices for it. Not really. She's kind of thinking that she may have some ability in playing the piano. So they go through uh, the talent show and it's finally Jing Mei's turn and she's dressed really nice and she wants to really uh, do the curtsy part well. And she comes up to the piano and she starts playing and everything sounds good until she hits a wrong note. And once she hears that wrong note, her confidence falls apart. It's one wrong note after another wrong note. Timing is off. It's a complete disaster. Everyone in the audience hears it. There's no hiding the fact that she has really messed up big time. Everyone applauds. Mr. Chung thinking she did a great job, stands up, yells, bravo, bravo. Everybody laughs. It was anything but bravo. Okay, so she talks again about her reflection. And she, her uh, time goes by. Um, oh, first I should say, she uh, goes home. And uh, her, she kind of argues with uh, her mother the next day about practicing the piano. She figures she's done such a terrible job at the recital that piano lessons are done. I'll never have to do this again. So um, she gets into an argument with her mother. And 
the argument turns ugly very quickly. So quick backdrop to the story. Her mother, when she left China, had uh, two kids by her previous marriage in China, young babies. She's carrying them and while she's escaping uh, to get out of there. She has to leave them uh, behind. So the kids are all wrapped up in baby clothes. And she uh, leaves them by a big tree, giving them up for dead, but hoping, hoping that someone picked them up and took care of them after she escapes. But she thinks that she's left them behind and they've died. Huge guilt burden uh, for her. Okay, so Jingmei and her mother are quarreling about the uh, practice uh, for uh, the piano. Her mother wants her to continue never give up, that sort of thing. So Jing Mei shocks her mother by saying the most hateful thing uh, she can summon up. And she says this, I wish I'd never been born. I wish I were dead like them. At the mention of the twin daughters in China that she was forced to abandon years ago. Mrs. Wu suddenly retreats and never mentions the piano again. As a result, Jing Mei is shocked when her mother offers her the piano as her 30th birthday present. So at the end of the argument, her mother locks herself in her bedroom, doesn't come out for a day or two. No more piano, no more practice, closes it up, never mentions piano again. And Jigme is surprised. Uh, years go by, uh, probably about 15 years go by. And um, her, before her mother uh, dies, um, she offers uh, Jing Mei uh, the piano as a gift for her 30th uh, birthday present. But um, she doesn't take it right away. Uh, she leaves it in the house. Uh, her mother passes away and she decides to uh, take care of the piano. So she uh, sends a uh, tuner a piano tuner over to the house and uh, gets the piano tune. And she's kind of going through the, under the bench is a little seat with some sheet music in it. She's going through that and um, she sees uh, the uh, songs that she was practicing way back 15 years ago. And one of them is called The Pleading Child, which she failed at, at the recital. And the other is called Perfectly Contented. So suddenly, Jing Mei realizes that the two titles are two halves of the same song. This realization brings together the theme of the tension between mothers and daughters, the mothers and daughters in this book are separated by many factors, age, experience, ambition, and culture. The pleading child cannot be perfectly contented because she cannot resolve her difficulties with her mother and herself. In her struggle, struggle with her mother, she is struggling with her own identity. Who is Jing Mei, Chinese? American, some combination of the two. She feels that she must reject her mother in order to find herself. Yet in doing so, she is rejecting her heritage and her identity. 
So this is a typical uh, situation for uh, first uh, born generation of immigrants. It's just, it's not just a Chinese thing. This is for all of the different immigrants that come to, and it's not necessarily America either. This could take place in England or France or Germany or what have you. Uh, coming from a different culture, adjusting to a new one. Where do you fall in between those two cultures? So uh, basically, uh, that's kind of the overview of the uh, story Two Kinds, which again is one of the 14 stories within the movie uh, Joy of Luck Club. So I hope to have a, a couple of uh, short video vignettes uh, of the movie uh, uh, Joy of Luck luck club uh, on this uh, uh, lesson for today so you can get a feel for the uh, the general feeling of the movie if you haven't seen it it's great it's won all kinds of awards and uh, it's a uh, it's a necessary uh, movie to watch to really see uh, about uh, Chinese American uh, lifestyle uh, coming to the United States and how difficult that transition really is. Okay, we'll move on to our next slide now. Okay, our next slide is about gonzo journalist and literary roustabout Hunter S. Thompson. Thompson was born in Louisville, Kentucky served in the Air Force and worked as a journalist in Puerto Rico before moving to San Francisco, where an article about the Hells Angels turned into a book project. He spent almost two years riding with the outlaw motorcycle gang. In 1966, he published a bestseller that took readers deep inside a subculture largely inaccessible to the outside world. He lived and wrote on the edge in a style that would become called gonzo journalism. That term captures his lifestyle, but it didn't really do justice to Thompson's command of language, his fearless reporting, or his fearsome intellect. 30 years writing for the Rolling Stone magazine. He idolized Ernest Hemingway. After a long bout with severe health issues, Thompson commits suicide. Jack Nicholson, John Kerry, and Johnny Depp gathered at Thompson's Colorado home where his ashes were shot out of a cannon under a full moon. Rolling Stone magazine was founded in San Francisco in 1967 by Jan Weiner, a former student at the University of California at Berkeley, and Ralph Gleason, a jazz critic for the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. The first issue appeared on November 9, 1967, with John Lennon on the cover. The magazine's creators intended Rolling Stone to be a barometer of the artistic tastes, political sensibilities of the student generation. The magazine effectively combined passion and professionalism using both proper English and street language. As the magazine increasingly came to define significant trends in discerning taste in rock and pop music. Appearances on its cover were coveted by established as well as up and coming musicians and albums of critical success. Along with the Beatles, Bob Dylan, Madonna, and many, many other musicians, Rolling Stone's cover featured significant actors, writers, 
and politicians such as Jack Nicholson, Susan Sontag, and Bill Clinton. In an effort to enhance its image, the magazine moved its offices to New York City in 1977. In May 2006, Rolling Stone printed its 1000th issue. Its success through the decades was due to its ability to adapt to constantly changing musical, political, and cultural climates. Issues of the Rolling Stone typically include music and movie reviews, celebrity stories, and photographs, information on new artists, fashion advice, and articles on politics. Rolling Stone has influenced pop culture through its all-time greatest list such as the 500 greatest albums of all time and the 100 greatest singers of all time. Hunter Thompson's Hell's Angels, the strange and terrible saga of the outlaw motorcycle gangs. Hell's Angels began as the article the Motorcycle Gangs, Losers and Outsiders, written by Thompson for the May 17, 1965 issue of The Nation. In March 1965, The Nation editor, Carrie McWilliams, wrote to Thompson and offered to pay the journalist for an article on the subject of motorcycle gangs and the Hells Angels in particular. Thompson took the job in the article, published about a month later, prompted book offers from several publishers interested in the topic. Thompson spent the next year preparing for the new book in close quarters with the Hells Angels, in particular the San Francisco and Oakland chapters of the club and their president, Ralph Sonny Barger. Thompson was up front with the angel about his role as a journalist. A dangerous move, given their mocked distrust of reporters from what the club considered to be bad press. Thompson was introduced to the gang by uh, Bernie Jarvis, a former club member, and then police beat reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. This introduction came from an angel and reporter allowed Thompson to get close to the gang in a way others had not been able. Thompson's residence in San Francisco. Far from being weary of this outsider, the angels were sincere in their participation often talking at length into Thompson's tape recorder and viewing early drafts of the article to ensure that he had his facts straight. The gang often visited his apartment in San Francisco, much to the dismay of his wife and neighbors. His relationship with the gang turned sour. He is beaten up after making a comment about one of its members and the relationship with the gang ends. Who are the Hell's Angels? The name was first suggested by an associate of the founder's name, Arvid Olson, who had served in the Hell's Angels squadron of the Flying Tigers in China during World War II. It is at least clear that the name was inspired from the tradition from World Wars I and II, whereby the Americans gave their squadrons fierce, death-defying titles. An example of this lies in one of the three P-40 squadrons of Flying Tigers, fielded in Burma and China, which was dubbed Hell's Angels. Different than the gangs we talked about in New York, Returning from war, these missed the camaraderie and excitement 
of the war experience. Riding a motorcycle was considered exciting and dangerous. These men had jobs and were born in America. The Hells Angels are often depicted in semi-mythical romantic fashion, free-spirited, iconic, bound by brotherhood and loyal loyalty. Semi-militaristic in its structure. The club became prominent then and established its notoriety as a part of the 1960s subculture movement in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district. Playing a part at many of the movement's seminal events. Members were directly connected to many of the counterculture's primary leaders, such as Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, Allen Ginsberg, Jerry Garcia, and the Grateful Dead, Timothy Leary, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Tom Wolfe. Writing about the club launched the career of gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson. Gaining membership often takes years. In order to become a Hell's Angel prospect, candidates must have a valid driver's license, a motorcycle over 750 cc's, and have the right combination of personal qualities. It is said the club excludes child molesters and individuals who have applied to become police or prison officers. Outlaw biker clubs formed in the late 1940s on the West Coast after the end of World War II. The culture was first popularized in Marlon Brando's film, the Wild One, 1953, which tells a story based very loosely on actual events. The Hells Angels are known for their bad reputation as a motorcycle club, but they have some surprisingly positive tidbits you may not know about. They hold a toy drive for kids around Christmas time every year. Charity rides are held and donations are given to the needy. On several occasions, musicians have hired Hells Angels to serve as concert security. Again, in 1961, when the Beatles' George Harrison invited a couple of San Francisco Angels to London, their presence at the concert went well with Harrison and the band and the Hells Angels would go on to win the respect of several musicians, hiring the Hells Angels as concert security. For at least five years, the Angels have had a Mayflower Thanksgiving Day food drive and chili cook-off to help out the less fortunate in their immediate area during the holidays. They gather non-perishable food items. They raise money for the disabled. Community involvement is key. It is a very complicated cultural phenomenon. Its influence worldwide chapters are from America, Europe, South America, Asia, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, and the Middle East. Esperanza Emily Spaulding, born 1984, is an American jazz bassist, singer, songwriter, and composer. Born and raised in Portland, Oregon, to an African-American father and a mother of Welsh, Native American, and Hispanic descent. She was raised in the King neighborhood of Northeast Portland, which at the time was known for gang violence. Her mother raised Esperanza and her brother as a single parent. Her accolades include four Grammy Awards, a Boston Music Award, and a Soul Train Music Award. Spaulding began playing music professionally in her childhood. 
performing as a violinist in the Chamber Music Society of Oregon at age five. She was later both self-taught and trained on a number of instruments, including guitar and bass. Her proficiency earned her academic scholarships to Portland State University and Berklee College of Music in Boston, both of which she attended studying music. In addition to writing and performing music, Spalding has also worked as an instructor, first at the Berklee College of Music, beginning at age 20, the youngest instructor at the university. In 1917, Spalding was appointed professor of the practice of music at Harvard University. In 2018, Spalding received an honorary doctorate of music from her alma mater, Berkeley College of Music, and served as commencement speaker at the ceremony. Spalding released her first album, Junjo, in 2006, City of Roses, winning the best arrangement instrument and vocals. Here are the lyrics of Esperanza Spaulding's song, City of Roses, in celebration of Spaulding's hometown of Portland, Oregon. In the City of Roses, streets lined with red brick and green branches, weren't rainy days that might seem bleak. Our rain is the paint that makes the lush land and the folks unique. City parks, wild berries, and old bridges. A rolling river brings goods from the sea. A mountain hooded in snow silently watching over me. And everywhere I go, these words are with me, and I find I take along a little piece of heaven with these memories of mine. From the city of roses, down along the river, weekend market. On sunny Saturdays, the waterfront comes alive. The street vendors and hippies, they keep all the people you could wish for or imagine. Uh, from the in the city center musicians husbands to make sure that there's a thriving jazz scene and everywhere i go these words are with me and i find i take along a little piece of heaven with these memories of mine everywhere i go these words are with me yeah and i find wherever i may travel I take with me the memories of mine from the city of roses. Everywhere I go, these words are with me and I find, I take along a little piece of heaven with these memories of mine. Esperanza Spalding, a city of roses. In this slide, we're going to talk about poet Philip Levine. Philip Levine was one of the leading poetic voices of his generation, a large iconic Whitman of the industrial heartland. The son of Russian Jewish immigrants, Levine was born and raised in industrial Detroit, where he began working in the auto factories at the age of 14. As a young boy in the midst of the Great Depression of the 1930s, he was fascinated by the events of the Spanish Civil War. His heroes were ordinary folks who worked at hopeless jobs simply to stave off poverty. Noted for his interest in the grime reality of blue collar work and workers, Levine resolved to find a voice for the voiceless. While working in the auto plants of Detroit during the 1950s, I saw that the people I was working with were voiceless in a way, he explained in Detroit Magazine. 
In terms of the literature of the United States, they weren't being heard. Nobody was speaking for them. And as young people will, you know, I took this foolish vow that I would speak for them. And that's what my life work would be. And sure enough, I've gone and done it. Or I've tried anyway. Levine earned his BA from Wayne State University in 1950 and began attending writing workshops at the University of Iowa as an unregistered student in 1953. Levine officially earned his Master's of Fine Arts from the University of Iowa in 1957 and later that year won a Jones Fellowship at Stanford University in California. Shortly thereafter, he began teaching at the California State University in Fresno, where he would remain until 1992. Levine also taught at Columbia, Princeton, New York University, Brown University, the University of California at Berkeley, and Tufts University. In The Simple Truth, the author uses a metaphor to compare a simple meal of food to the simplicity of things people do not see meaningful. He sh then shows the reader how easily it is to overlook these things that we take for granted every day. Philip states that he discovers with his friend Henri what the simple truths actually mean. Philip describes the definition of finding meaning within the simplest things humans take for granted every day. He concludes with another metaphor comparing the simplicity of dirt and salt to contribute to the complex makeup of the earth and metal. Listen to Philip Levine read his poem, The Simple Truth. Okay, our next slide is going to talk about our reading assignment for next week by Ambrose Bierce, a distant cousin. Ambrose Gwinnett Bierce was born in 1842. He was an American short story writer, journalist, poet, and Civil War veteran. His book, The Devil's Dictionary, was named as one of the 100 greatest masterpieces of American literature. His story, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, has been described as one of the most famous and frequently anthologized story in American literature. Pierce was born in a log cabin in Ohio and was of entirely English ancestry. All of his forebearers came to North America between 1620 and 1640 as part of the great Puritan migration. He often wrote critically of both Puritan values and people who made a fuss about genealogy. He was the 10th of 13 children, all of whom were given names by their father, beginning with the letter A. A prolific and versatile writer, Bierce was regarded as one of the most influential journalists in the United States and as a pioneering writer of realist fiction. For his horror writing, ranked him alongside Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. He may well be the greatest satirist America has ever produced. His war stories influenced Stephen Crane, Ernest Hemingway, and others, and he was considered an influential and feared literary critic. In recent decades, Bierce has gained wider respect as a fabulist and for his poetry. In December 1913, Bierce traveled to Mexico to gain firsthand experience 
of the Mexican Revolution. He disappeared and was rumored to be traveling with rebel troops. He was never seen again. Pierce has been fictionalized in more than 50 novels, short stories, movies, television shows, stage plays, and comic books. Most of these works draw upon Bierce's vivid personality, colorful wit, relationships with famous people such as Jack London and William Randolph Hearst. An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge was originally published in the San Francisco Examiner in 1890 and was first collected in Bierce's books, Tales of Soldiers and Civilians. The story is set during the American Civil War and is known for its irregular time sequence and twist ending. Bierce's abandonment of strict linear narration in favor of the internal mind of the protagonist is an early example of the stream of consciousness narrative mode. Please watch the provided video, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Okay, on this slide, we're going to talk about uh, Hoshi Mori, who was born in Oakland, California during World War II. He and his family were interned at Topaz Ward Relocation Center in Utah, where Mori edited the journal Trek for a year. After the war, Mori returned to the Bay Area in San Francisco where he continued to write. He is the author of Yokohama, California, The Chauvinist, and other stories, The Woman from Hiroshima. Mori worked most of his adult life in a small family nursery outside San Francisco in California. Though Mori was a short story fiction writer, his stories echoed and reflected the life of Japanese Americans in pre and post war America. Imbued with wonderment at the everyday routine of the people around him, Maury's stories told of seemingly menial situations that emphasized the emotional connections and culture that are all that all Americans share regardless of their ethnic background. This tone was one of the main reasons why Maury's work was so successful. It was accessible to more than just the Japanese American community. Even Maury's work while in the internment camp was from the optimistic perspective, a style of writing in the internment camps which encouraged Japanese Americans not to be pessimistic and to have faith in the American democratic system. Though the majority of Mori's work was considered lighthearted and even comical, some of his works did emphasize the taut emotional strain that a Japanese American felt before after and during the war. Most of his works pre-war described the slightly comical problems that a Japanese American dealt with on a daily basis, trying to balance their Japanese culture with the American one. During his internment, Maury's tone occasionally became dark, especially in a short story dedicated to his brother, who was badly injured in the 442 Regimental Combat Team, which describes a fight between brothers over patriotic duty to their country. Isaiah E. Noda is a Japanese-American that writes about her personal experiences 
growing up as the daughter of Japanese immigrants. Kai Seiya is a writer who retired from Dartmouth College in New Hampshire after 10 years as an assistant to the president. Author of the Yamoda Colony, a history of one of the earliest successful Japanese settlements in California, and a published poet, she has worked as a personal historian assisting individuals in the writing and publication of their memoirs. She and her husband, Christopher, live in a farm established by her parents in New Hampshire. The theme of growing up Asian in America, Noda is trying to make a statement about how someone's race does not define them as a person and what it takes to find one's identity. Okay, so this wraps up our week 11 lesson. And you need to um, take one of the three choices that you made uh, for your research paper and focus on that. That will be our final lesson of the course. So you've done some initial research on all three of them and decide on one uh, to focus in on. Okay, so that wraps us up for today and we'll talk to you again next week. Okay, bye.